Authors Over 50, Writing in Life's Sweetest Third. Authors Over 50's weekly podcast celebrates writers and their journeys to publication. Writing after 50 is a whole story on its own, so let's skip to Life's Sweetest Third and talk with authors about their journey from pen to publish. Welcome, I'm Julia Daly, your host, and I invite you to listen to interviews with writers who've achieved their goal of publishing a book just later in life. We've seen award lists for under 30 or under 40, but I've yet to see lists for those who've achieved a significant milestone of their own, launching a new career and publishing their first book after the age of 50. We will hear about these authors' inspirations, struggles, strategies, and the smell of that first book. These writers' journeys inspire me because I'm one of them. My guest today is a romantic at heart. Her storybook reunion with her husband began in junior high school. After 22 years of bad timing and missed opportunities, the stars finally aligned during a group trip together as adults. They've been together ever since. When she's not writing her latest romance, she's watching rom-coms and spending time with family in the beautiful Texas Hill Country. Welcome to Authors Over 50, C.D. Giles. Yes, hello, everybody. So I'm so glad to be here, Julia, and talking with you today. I'm glad to have you. C.D., our opening question on Authors Over 50 is always, what took you so long to write your first book? Oh my goodness. You know, it's one of those things that it wasn't until the pandemic that I actually had time to write because before the pandemic, the, my day job, I do 75% travel. And, um, and so since the pandemic, I haven't traveled anymore, which is nice, you know, so it gives me that extra time. And, um, the book that I wrote that my first book, could this be love? I, it came to me in a dream. And I got a, I, in the dream, I was writing the book. So I was writing out the first chapter. And so I um, actually, it was like two something in the morning. I jumped out of bed and said, oh my gosh, I'm going to forget this book if I don't write it down like right now. And I got up and started writing the book. I wrote it for four hours straight. And then after that, every day, the, 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 the characters were in my head. They were talking to me. They wanted to get out of the head. And it just, the, the book just really flowed out of me. It was, it, it's been an amazing process. Well, I've heard a lot of authors say ideas came to them in dreams, but not that they were actually writing in their dreams. So I think that's unusual. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was too funny. And I even said in the dream, I kept telling myself, oh, this is good. And, oh, this is fun. I love their banter. And don't forget it. <laughs> I remember telling myself that in a dream. It was just hilarious. Well, did your storybook reunion with your husband inspire you to write in the romance genre? I would say yes. Like it, when you look at the acknowledgments in my books, I really tout him. I give him kudos first because he really kind of gave me the belief that love exists. And I really do credit him for being able to write in the romance genre. He's even to this day, you know, he's just so, so um, chivalrous and he's just such a great guy and um, really lets me know there are good guys out there and, you know, all that good stuff. So um, I would say he's definitely my inspiration. Well, you've chosen the best-selling genre in the world, so that's a kudos to you. And I've noticed that you've written about biracial couples, generational inheritances, steamy romances. What draws you to these subjects? Wow. Um, for me, you know, representation matters. And in the dream, these were the characters in my dream. And um, so, so really what draws me to it, um, I am Creole, my, my background is Creole, my, my dad is from New Orleans, and well, family from Mississippi and, and Louisiana, and, and I wanted to write about that as well, you know, about 
um, our rich heritage. And so that gave me an opportunity to kind of fuse some of that into Gabby's character, who her family is from New Orleans. Well, that hits home for me because I was born in New Orleans and grew up in Mississippi. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) CD, once you wrote this book, how did you proceed? Did you search for an agent, decide to choose a hybrid, a small press, or did you self-publish? I went straight to self-publishing. One of my cousins, I reached out to him. He had published a Christian book. And so I kind of just wanted to pick his brain and say, hey, how did you do it? You know, what are the pros and cons? You know, that kind of thing. And I really wanted the book to get out there. I just, it was, it's such a good book. And I wanted the book to get out there. So I decided to self-publish just like he did. And, um, and so have really enjoyed the journey, have learned a lot along the way. I didn't know anything about the book business, you know, before I published the book. And so I would say I'm still learning. Um, but but I, I definitely, um, I wanted the book out there sooner or later. And um, so that's why I didn't look for an agent or try to go to a publishing house. I just felt that was going to slow it down a little bit. Is this your favorite genre to read as well? It is. It is. Um, you know, I, before writing and publishing my first book, I probably would read on average, maybe five to six books a month because I'm an avid reader. And so it's not uncommon. I'm reading multiple books at the same time at different places and different books. Um, So I really do love the genre. It just, it makes me happy. You know, it's it's goodness. You know, of course I watch the Hallmark channel as well. So, um, so that, that that really for me is probably the the why on, on why I, I, I read this genre and love it so much. Well, I know you've written a second book now. How did writing your first book change your process of writing? You know, for um, the first book I I wrote, my my approach is to write the scenes or, or, you know, chapter as as they come to me. You know, so uh, I wrote like for in the in book one, I wrote chapter one, of course, first. And because that was in my dream. And then immediately after that, the last chapter is what came to me. So that's what I wrote. And I've kept that same process for book two. Um, It's just for me, it's it's just easier to kind of let the characters speak through me and what they want to say at the time. So I don't try to make it sequential and shut them down by any stretch of the imagination. I go ahead and write whatever it is they want me to have on that paper at that time. And do you do that on a certain routine? Uh, you travel so much or, or have traveled so much. Do you, do you, are you a morning person or a night person? When do you get your writing in? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. Um, so for me, I found that I need to write, I, I write after work and I usually write before dinner time. So it's usually sometime between that, you know, five to about seven or eight time frame. And, um, and that way, because if I write late at night, the characters are still speaking to me and I can't go to sleep. And then I end up staying up most of the night, just capturing whatever is coming through. So I found that if I can give myself that window of time, it works better for me. So this is a series, correct? You have book one and book two. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's correct. Will there be more? in the series? Yeah, yeah. I'm actually writing book three now. It goes to the editor next month. And book three is about Travis, who is Jake's best friend. And Jake is a twin. So his sister is the the romance, the, the heroine in the book. So uh, so this is going to be, it's, it's going to be, um, it's a fake romance. And, um, you know, and it's also, you know, the best friend's sister bro, um, tropes. So I tried to, I went on and picked two of those tropes for this, for book three and then book four. will kind of, I think that's going to wrap up the series and that'll be Gabby's best friend. And Jake has another best friend uh, called CJ and that'll be book four. 
Well, everybody advises that we need to write series, that that you need to get to about seven books before we really start earning any any real money. So you you need to keep this series going and sell uh, sell one of those to Hallmark for a movie. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and then I've also already written a rock star series that I've started, but I haven't published that one yet. I'm trying to get book three out there first because folks are like, when is book three coming out? And uh, so I'm shooting for like the Christmas time for um, for book three, because it's set around Thanksgiving to Christmas and early into, you know, winter, spring. Well, I know that you romance readers just gobble up these books, like you said, and they're always waiting for the next one. And you have to write pretty rapidly to be able to keep up or either I've heard people say that they've written a series and they waited to release it so they could release each book rapidly after each other. That's a, yeah, that's a smart approach. I think I'm probably going to take that for the Rockstar series. Did real people inspire any of these characters? Um, I would say it's pro- like Gabby's probably a mixture of several, like, like maybe four to five people. So it's not one person specifically, but I would say probably multiple folks. She has different qualities from different people that I've known and, and I've crossed my path, you know, doesn't have to be any friends or anything like that, but just people I've come in contact with. But tell us a little bit more about your your writing process. How long does it take you to get that first draft completed? And then what editing process do you use? Yeah, um, so I usually write anywhere from one to three months for my books. And um, and then after I finish it, after that, you know, one month or three month period, I let it sit for a little bit, like maybe about two to three weeks. And then I go back and do the first edit myself. And then I have some, some beta readers that will read for me as well and give me some input on if there's anything that I missed. And then I'll, I'll take it through and kind of look at it one more time and then I'll send it to my editor. That's fast. You are, (laughs) you're a blazing fast writer. (laughs) Well, you know, all of us, writers like to write and we want to be in our little cubby hole writing and we don't like to promote ourselves. And so marketing becomes an issue. And even with the big five uh, publishers, they're requiring their authors to do most of their publicity. Have you overcome any of these challenges and found anything that works for you? I wish I have. I tell you, I ask all of my author friends, what are you doing? What are you finding that works? Um, I haven't found anything that really is the silver bullet, you know, Um, so that is definitely still a challenge for me. And um, I'm not going to give up, but um, but I am trying to find some creative ways to do marketing that's authentic for me. I think that's really important. You know, I I see all of these wonderful stories about TikTok authors and how well they're doing. So I I think we're all drawn to that. But then we get in there and think, I don't know if this is where I should be. Yes, (laughs) I tell you, I need I need probably a 20 year old that will just do it for me. You know, (laughs) that's what I think. Are there any specific books or seminars or writing retreats or groups that you can share that improved your writing journey? Yeah. um, Romance Writers of America, they have a lot and then they have chapters throughout the U S and so um, what's nice about that is you can sign up for writing clinics and then they have um, um, previously, um, recorded webinars that you can listen to and kind of get some ideas from there. And so I am, I'm always working on my craft. It's important to me that what I'm delivering that I'm continuing to grow as a writer as well, you know, so, so I do take my, my continuing education very seriously. I think I do the same. I, I love to join our professional organizations, even when before I was a writer, I always joined every professional organization of whatever career I was in at the time. I think that's just vital, you know, to us. 
Yeah, I definitely would agree. And I was the same here. You know, I have an HR technology background and um, leadership roles in that space. And, and so I've always joined either, you know, the, um, for project managers as PMI for HR, it's Shurum, you know, so things like I, the same way I, I joined those as well. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about the passages that you've brought to share today and then read from your book so we can hear your tone and voice. Absolutely. So what I'm going to read is um, for Could This Be Love? It's going to be chapter one. And it's the opening scene where Jake and Gabby first meet. All right. So this is in Gabby's point of view, starting off in Gabby's point of view. So I do a he he said, she said point of view throughout the book. Okay, so this is Gabby. I walk up to the bar on a mission. I've earned this drink after working eight hours straight while on vacation. Hi, I look down at the bartender's name tag. Mark from Poland. Then I whisper, can I have a sex on the beach? I hear someone chuckle beside me. Darn, I guess I didn't actually whisper that embarrassing cocktail name as quietly as I thought. I look to my right and I find the sharpest green eyes that I've ever seen. I swear that he's looking right through me. And that light scruff that he has going on is doing something to my lady parts that have lain dormant for way too long. So, sex on the beach. Is that on your to-do list for the cruise? Oh, my, uh, no. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, I'm going to shut up now. I can't believe he's talking to me. Why the hell am I stuttering? You know why, Gabby. This white boy is fine. Okay, Gabby, play it cool. He can't tell that it's been two years, three months, and 10 days since your last non-electronically induced orgasm. So now from Jake's point of view, this girl is beyond beautiful. She has light caramel skin with long, light brown straight hair and blonde highlights. Her eyes look like they're hazel green and her body is beyond perfection. She's wearing a sleeveless turquoise maxi dress that is fitted showing off her trim waist and her toned arms. I'm so checking her out, but I'm trying to be cool about it while trying also not to sneak peek at her breasts so I go for keeping my eyes above her chest and chuckle because this girl is a riot. I already feel lighter just being around her and can't stop smiling. Hi, sex on the beach. I'm Jake. As I reach out to shake her hand, she doesn't immediately try to take my hand. So I add, this is where you give me your name. Yes. Yes, you're right. Um, that is how it's supposed to work. I'm Gabby. I'm, and then I go on to say um, for Jake, I hope that you don't mind me asking, but why are you in this bar alone? I came on this cruise with my best friend. We had everything planned. Then she met a guy while we we're in line waiting to check in. They hit it off and have been together ever since. How about you? I needed some time to decompress. My friend wanted to go to the nightclub. I wanted something quieter. So here I am. And that's it. That's great. I, I love how you have really captured the differences in the female point of view and the male point of view. I, I could hear those voices very well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, one thing that I, I like with my, um, with my novels, I have, I write novellas, um, I like them to have some type of humor, something to make us laugh, something that makes it light and flirty. And um, so that's something that I really try hard to make sure I infuse in the in the stories. Do you ever Google yourself or read reviews? If so, how do you deal with the bad or the good ones? No, I, I have not. Um, you know, I, I think it's one of those things I probably will as I go on into my career. But for now, I just want to make sure that I'm following my instinct, listening to my gut, really making sure, you know, I'm really anchored on where I what who I am as an author and have my own identity and try not to be one of those authors just trying to please a lot of people. You know, I really want to stay true to myself. 
So that's why I've taken that approach for now. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, as I continue to um, grow as an author, I'm hoping I'll have so, a team that can do that for me and kind of bring, you know, bring the things that need to be brought to my attention. I think that's wise. What does your family think of, of your writing? Oh, wow. They are so supportive. Um, you know, my mom, when she was living, she just passed away in August and uh, she read book one and it's steamy <laughs> and mama read it. Um, and so they, they are, they, you know, both of my both my sisters read it as well. And um, everybody's just so supportive. My husband is very supportive and, um, you know, uh, he's going to start going with me as I go to different, you know, book festivals and things like that. He said he would like to do that, too, sometimes. And and so it's been nice. It's really been nice. You know, if I let the team know, hey, I'm under deadline, I really have to write or I, I really have to focus. And and so they totally understand, you know, they'll work around my schedule if we're trying to plan like a dinner or a gathering or anything like that. Well, you are a brave woman to write steamy romances because any romance scenes I have in my books, they're fade to black. <laughs> <laughs> what do you what do you think is your writing kryptonite? You know, um, this is going to sound strange, but for me, I, I don't watch a lot of TV anyway, as it is. But um, I try to just make sure it's things that are goodness and hope, not wholesome, but good, definitely goodness. Um, so I don't I don't um, watch anything that's like a horror flick or anything like that. Um, I, I'll, I, I'll, I'll watch some dramas, but I have to be careful, like what the content is, like what what the story is about um, before I decide if I'm going to um, look at it or not. So for me, that's, that's for, I, I have to stay in a good space and a good head space. Um, that's important for me as a writer. I feel the same way because whatever goes into our head stays there and we replay scenes over and over. And I've tried to watch some of these true crime television shows and they just horrify me and they linger and stay in my body for so long. Yes, yes, yeah. So I, I mean, I, I think they're fun. I know there's a huge following for those podcasts and things of that nature, but I just can't. I can't. Was there a, a large learning curve for you to try to learn the self-publishing route? Because it that, that's a lot of working parts. It's a lot of working parts. So it was a huge learning curve. Um, and I just, you know, found folks that had published before had self-published before and picked their brain <laughs> excessively and, and, um, and, and just really uh, wanted to understand what worked, what didn't work, what was their approach? Is there anything that I'm missing? You know, that kind of thing. Are you trying to keep your covers all similar? Are you using the same graphic artists for those? I am for, for this series, I'll be using the same graphic designer, and then um, for my Rockstar series, uh, I may look for something, I won't say edgy, but something that I want, I want the, the um, covers to be more rockish, you know, kind of thing. So I really want to make sure those pop. So I may look for a, a, a graphic designer that has done those types of, of covers before. I'm really trying to figure out, you know, who I'm going to target or, or resource for that. Do you have an author idol? Um, anybody that, that you really enjoy reading? And if so, what would you ask that person if you could? Oh, yeah. For um, Brenda Jackson, she's an African-American author and has been writing for a long time. Um, I got a chance to meet her last year. And um, I mean, she's just very down to earth and really easy to approach. Um, I think probably the main question that I would ask her is more around, like, if you, you know, for your younger writing self, is there one thing that you wish you had known at that point that you know now that kind of has helped you as you've moved through your career? That would be a great question for anybody, because I think we learn so much from each other and our writing community is such a generous community and they're willing to share 
with each other. And that's why I enjoy going to writer retreats or writer conferences, because I always think if you pick up one tip, just one tip that you can use the entire time, it was worth, you know, the effort and the expense of going. Yeah, that is, that is so true. Well, CD, as always, our last interview question is our writers over 50 are quite unique. Do you have advice for writers 50 and above? I I think the main advice is you're never too old to start. I think all of us have a book inside of us, whether it's a memoir or, um, or romance or thriller or fantasy whatever that might be, don't, don't limit yourself. Don't put a restriction at, oh my gosh, you know, look at all, look how young the, the, the the authors are now or whatever that may be. I really go ahead and and get that book published. And, you know, even, especially if, you know, even if it's something that may be just for your family, you may want to write, have a lot of information about, you know, um, the family tree and genealogy. I mean, there's just so many different avenues that, an author can go in. And so I I really recommend that. One of the things that I do as well is I have found ways to make sure that I either have a notepad with me at all times, or I use my note app on my phone, or I use voice memos. If I'm driving and a scene comes to me, I, I always stop what I'm doing, get my voice memo as I'm driving and dictate it out. And the reason I say that is because if you wait until, oh, I'll do that later, when later comes, you don't remember like what it was, what did they say, what was what was my idea, what was my epiphany, it's hard to get that back. And so when when folks talk about writer's block, for me, I just, I don't believe in writer's block, I, I don't, I, I really believe that you need to write where you're at and um, and then just keep moving through the process. And, uh, and so I, that's why I believe that if you just, because things are coming to you all the time. And so just find ways to make sure that you are prepared to capture that, because that could be your next book. Well, that is very sage advice from a writer who uh, began not very long ago and has become quite prolific. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us, us today. And I'm happy to now say that you're counted among our authors over 50. Thank you so much, Julie. I, I've so enjoyed our discussion today. Thank you for joining us today. Please look for Authors Over 50 every Thursday when we will have conversations with accomplished debut novelists over the age of 50. Please subscribe and share with a friend. And check out my own publication journey after 50 at www.juliadaily, that's D-A-I-L-Y, like dailynewspaper.com. Until next time, keep reading and writing. And remember, it's never too late to fulfill a dream in life's sweetest third.